Well, guys, today's guest, uh, I'm really excited. It's not often that you get to sort of help introduce a guest to a new market. Um, but today's guest, uh, you may know her from her works on 2000 AD and Judge Dredd comics, uh, but she is poised to make an American comics debut uh, with the upcoming series from Dynamite, Barbarella, uh, just coming up in just a few short weeks. So here to talk to me about that is Miss Anna Morozova. How are you today? Hello. I'm very well, Brandon. Thank you very much for inviting me. And nope. big hello to your audience, for everybody watching. I'm very glad to be here. We're excited to have you. Um, now, I have to apologize. I didn't realize um, when we were setting this up that it's 5 a.m. for you right now. So it's so good. No apologies needed. You know, it's all fine. Like last week, I did a lot of traveling to a convention abroad. So, like, you just get used to those things, <laughs> you know, like yeah. getting up at four. Uh, going to bed at two, especially when you're drawing the pages away. Sometimes you forget about the time, so it's all fine. Man, so well, look, we'll we'll get right in then. Um, so you uh, you're known for your work on 2000 AD comics, um, and like I said, this Barbarella book that you've got coming up with Dynamite will be your first from an, for an American publisher, and I think that's awesome. Um, so you're, you're, you're well on your way and making a splash, but I'm curious to know, um, sort of how you got into comics, not necessarily, you know, how you got your first job, but really what inspired you to, to pick up comics as, as a profession? Well, <laughs> you know, I've always, I think like many people in this industry will go like, I was, I've always been like excited about drawing, let's say, especially artists. So, um, I've been drawing all the time. Um, and I remember even when I was like little or in school, I would do like humorous comics mm -hmm. about people I knew, about my friends, you know, like they were pretty amusing little things. But I also just genuinely like drawing. Um, interestingly though, like I did go to an art school, but it wasn't a classical art school um, in, you know, like kind of normal term. Because our teacher, she was primarily an interior designer and she encouraged us to do quite experimental things. Mm. So I did a lot of things like which were stylized. So I always kind of considered it more as a hobby thing. Like I just thought, you know, I just like kind of doodling away while listening to classes in school and, you know, my like notebooks in school, they were pretty much covered <laughs> in drawings. <laughs> right. For instance, if those were like history lessons, I would cover them in thematical drawings. So if we were like learning something about ancient Greece, it would be all about <laughs> ancient Greece. <laughs> so uh, that actually helped me get uh, good marks on those classes as well, because teachers uh, found it very amusing just to go through drawings sometimes rather than check the correct answers. So it's always kind of been there, you know, but at the same time, like I've also been like really into like something more science, you know, mm. like I kind of always enjoy like physics, math, chemistry, all that. So I eventually <laughs> got ended up, like ended up getting a degree in uh, something which is quite close to like programming and UX, UI design. Okay. So I never was kind of planning to get into comics like full time or anything. Plus, to be fair, like I've never been really a reader of comics growing up either. Like I would occasionally pick up something here and there, you know, like usually just if I liked like the image, I like the cover of the book, you know, like some of those were kind of translated Disney properties or like some collected things. And I would always like go through art. I always enjoyed art, you know, but I would never like commit um, to reading like, let's say proper like American series, for instance, or a mm. British series, you know. But I do remember like reading some of the translated European comics because they were of Disney property. And that was the time when I discovered like some fantastic Italian artists, you know, so my influence has always been kind of like more even European, if you will, until mm. I discovered American comics. So I really only got into making comics, um, just after finishing my degree, my like undergraduate degree, and I got an offer of a job in a 
like financial company pretty much as a UX UI designer. But the university at the, si at the time, they um, were doing like a master's postgraduate program at Comex, like year long. And since my UX UI project, uh, digital interaction project, if you will, like app design, was pretty much um, implementing comics into city environment and like telling a dark history of the town uh, through technology of AR, which mm. I then illustrated myself. So it was similar to Pokemon Go, where like people would go to the city center, they would scan surroundings and learn some dark story about witchcraft in a small city in Scotland would be told. So I presented this project and people at the university were like, oh, like, sure, you can either go for a job or we have this comics course, which you can try. And to me, it was a challenge. So I thought, okay, I'll use this one year um, to essentially develop a portfolio and see if I'm capable of doing something like that. Um, like do my kind of test on sequential art properly and things. And this is how I ended up getting a job. <laughs> much. Wow after graduating there. So and I've been working and 2000 AD uh, became my first employer. So it just so happened that they saw the work of the students of the university and they were like, hey, come and draw a future shock for us. <laughs> wow. So that's that's interesting. So I've got friends who are uh, well, my best friend is actually in UX UI design. Mm -hmm. um, he was a graphic designer first and just sort of found that as like a nice entryway into like, you know, a nice cushy tech job and it's working out mm -hmm. for him. Right. Like it's quite lucrative. Um, it's quite an interesting, fun, pleasant job. I absolutely understand your friend. Right. And so what's interesting to me, just hearing your story is like UX UI design can be like a pathway to, you know, a pretty comfortable career. Right. And, and as you're pursuing that, you sort of get bitten by this comics bug and, you know, by all accounts, comics is not a very lucrative career. Uh, what was it about comics that made you decide, like, even though you have these skills, these technical skills, like this is what you wanted to pursue? Uh, I have this like really nice vision of, you know, like, wouldn't it be amazing to just be able to draw pretty much every day mm -hmm. and get paid for it, you know. And of course, drawing is hard, drawing is difficult. It requires quite some time to develop skills, you know. And it's, at the start, especially, it was quite difficult. But somehow, like, I can't quite explain it, you know, but it just felt like a right decision. Mm -hmm. um, because to me, it seemed like you're pretty much in charge of your, up to a point, you're in charge of your creative flow, you know. You are working with a team, like with a writer, with the editor, but you can develop and explore more there. Um, so, they just, <laughs> I remember, like, actually making this decision, you know, because the job was pretty much right there, like internship, you know, which would pretty much lead to a job because we did some really interesting collaboration with the company, you know, and some other offers, and then essentially the opportunity to go for this degree. And I just like, I just feel like I want to be drawing, plus it felt like, you know, because I never considered that it would be possible. Mm -hmm. I thought it would be too good of an opportunity to miss out on. So. This is why we're here now, <laughs> talking about Barbarella and all the things. Right. Yeah. No, that's amazing. I think it's it's really cool. I mean, part of the reason I do what I'm doing, uh, just in interviewing people, is like it's so awesome to hear people's stories, like to understand sort of what makes them tick. Uh, but it's also inspiring to hear, you know, people pursuing artistic careers or creative fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Um you know, while making a living for themselves, like it's, it's possible. Um, so I, I'm curious to get a little bit more into your background. Um, I know that originally you're from Russia and you've kind of been mm -hmm. all over in Scotland and the UK. Um, but I'm curious to know, like maybe how 
the different places you've been and lived may influence your work? Do you feel like there are things that you've picked up just in your travels? I would say so, yes. Um, you know, because it's an interesting background altogether. For instance, when growing up and I was little, I remember reading those amazing like folklore books, which were often illustrated. And they were illustrated in a very sophisticated way, a very realistic, beautiful drawing, but at the same time, it was fantasy. Mm. So I grew up pretty much draw, like reading those, like in the Slavic fairy tales and stuff. Um, then when I partially was kind of growing up between Russia and Estonia, um, in Estonia, of course, has got their cultural background, you know, they're all kind of mythical stories and... Estonia is a bit closer to Scandinavia when it comes to like visual art or like folklore even, you know. So that influence was certainly there. Um, and both in Russia and Estonia, we'll like, be picking up occasional comics or like really nice kind of illustrated magazines or something like that, you know. But when I moved to the UK to study, that was the first time when I came across 2000 AD. Um, so... I remember actually seeing the Judge Dredd movie poster when it first came out. At that time, I was still in Estonia at that point. But then actually on the shelves of the shop, I saw some of the collected um, like collections, essentially, of some 2000 AD stories. Mm. And I remember the first one I picked, and it was quite a revelation to me generally about like how comics can be. And... If before, to me, it was more about, you know, kind of adventure. Um, well, I can still call this book an adventure, I suppose. But they were more like kind of, mm, uh, they were less dark, like fantasy stories. It was like um, some occasional American, like action comics issues, you know, like superhero stuff. But when I came across like 2000 AD um, materials, you know, the first book I picked up was Nemesis the Warlock first mm. book collection. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it was written by Pat Mills, um, essentially co-creator of 2000 AD, okay. and Kevin O'Neill, mm. who you may know from League of the Extraordinary Gentlemen, he mm. illustrated that. So, um, of course, like later on in those issues, like different other artists came in, but initially it was started by Kevin O'Neill. And, you know, I completely blew my mind because it was not what I was expecting from comics because like if you and viewers get the chance to look at this book it's a very um, deep dark story that essentially reflects on many many dark aspects of tragic aspects of like human history you know but it's set outside like it's set in the you know in a galaxy and like mm. different planets the different world but i remember like seeing the drawings by kevin and Neil, you know when it's um again it was something uh, completely extraordinary because the amount of details that went into this work uh, the amount of like little tiny like easter eggs you would draw in the background you know which would relate to the story and it actually made you like made me um sit on those pages for quite some time. I would read it fast, and then I would just like look at the art, and every time I would look at it, I would find something else and something else. It was very clever. It was very smart, and the style was so unexpected, you know. Mm. And then, of course, 2000 AD, like, th it was just like the first impression, because it was literally the first book I picked up before I started working for them. Mm. I only picked it up because it was being sold in a shop next to my part-time job, you know, and I would go there <laughs> during lunch and I would like see, because the owner would sometimes bring like occasional comics, you know, just like very random selection and whatever I liked, I picked up. And, but going forward, of course, 2000 AD has some legacy, you know, like it's definitely a collection of some extraordinary stories. So this is, in the UK, like I discovered that, well, it can be like that as well. Mm. It can be very, like, totally out of this world, you know. Mm. And of course, 2000 AD, you know, like, then I learned about their history and how revolutionary this comic was, you know, of course. But then also, 
the fact that I was staying in Dundee, which is also, um, you could say, like capital of comics for Scotland, mm. because this is where the office of DC Thompson are based. I don't know like if American audience are familiar with that. And the common joke is DC or DC Thompson. But DC Thompson's are, um, they also, um, they're a big publisher in general. So they publish okay. uh, like newspapers and magazines and they have radio stations, stuff like But they also publish comics and specifically the comics for kids, like humorous comics such mm -hmm. as Beano, um, which is big part of like British comics legacy, you know. Um, you can say it's comics for kids, but trust me, like people of all ages enjoy them because mm. <laughs> that's funny, you know. Um, there's, um, you know, so I did my research in them as well. Like I would just often be involved with like, people who work for DC films, and, you know, like I would discover about those comics, would go to, um, to their archive, you know, that has like, tons and tons of original pages of art produced through the years, like some archives that DC films has bought, you know, so there's like some fantastic work. So I've been pretty lucky as I was like getting exposed to all this like um, art and very, very different approaches to comics, I would say. Mm. And, you know, now interestingly, I find myself in Athens and I've been here for the past year and also Athens, like Greece, they have their own comic scene and mm -hmm. they have their own unique approach to, to comics. And for instance, here I find that zine culture, like fanzine culture is very big, you know. So obviously it pushes people to be very, very experimental, very um, like creative with their styles, be very like... Um, essentially kind of reflective of themselves, reflective of their struggles, reflective mm. of society, you know. And art is like here everywhere, especially in the city center. People love it. You know, you you go through the streets and there's a lot of graffiti. A lot of them have like very strong social message, of course. So you're exposed to that and you're exposed to like the... Um, this thinking process behind art and the motivation mm. behind art. And of course, like their local kind of comics culture, like artists who are here. So so certainly, yeah, I would say it's quite an eclectic mix altogether. Man, I'm jealous. I'm a, I'm a bit jealous because in your travels, it sounds like no matter where you've gone, the 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 place you've been has a different sort of experience with comics. Right. Like, and there's a, a very specific comics culture specific to wherever, you know, you've landed, yeah. you know, here in the States, we have what's known as the direct market. And it's pretty much, you know, every comic shop in the country pretty much carries the same comics, you know, and we all order out of the same catalogs. Now we do have like an indie culture as well. Like there are small press expos and, and different like conventions you can go to. Mm -hmm. And so you'll start to see different uh, things like different cities might have sort of local people who are doing comics, but you know, we don't hear about them, uh, you know, on a by and large level. It's just kind of, if you happen to go there, if you know, then you know, and it's kind of, it's really underground. Mm -hmm. um, but being able to just go to a different city and just be like, wow, okay, so this is what comics are like in Athens. This is what comics are like in Desden. Like, that's interesting uh, to me. Yeah, you know, like, um, quite interestingly, you mentioned that, but uh, when I did the Masters in Comics in Scotland, which was very much a creative degree, you know, it was like um, postgraduate in art, mm -hmm. um, which was interesting after undergraduate in science to like move into art and feel like oh this is great so we obviously like um most of the time we spend doing making comics you know like drawing developing skills but of course there was like um a theory part as well like different mm -hmm. lectures where would, like the students would be like presented with various examples of like sequential art from around the world and this is also like where you see like wow this is like totally different approaches everywhere 
But I remember we did pay quite a bit of attention to to the U.S. underground scene. Mm. Well, you know, like comics that were not um, not necessarily mainstream. I remember I was quite under the impression I had to do a presentation about that one. It was American Splendor. Yes. Um, you're aware of this one. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, so uh, Harvey Picard. Was, yes, yes, yes. yes. So, which um, had like a movie adaptation of it and uh, uh, the author, um, he went on a big U.S. talk show. Like, mm. um, I don't want to name the one in case I'm wrong, but it was interesting to see as well how how he turned, you know, just... Um, everyday life and to pretty much a comic sensation as well. So right. um, that was one example I remember clearly. That's cool. It's cool to hear how other people experience American comics. Um, Cause you know, for us, we grow up with like the different cartoons and, and for the most part, you know, until you really dive in comics are just superheroes. And, you know, so if you ask the average American, Hey, do you read comic books? Like, no, they might go see a Marvel movie or something like that. Um, but people would be very surprised to know that there are historical comics and biographical comics and, and all sorts of things. Like people, they when they hear comics, they either think like newspaper strips for kids mm -hmm. or they're thinking like superhero comics for kids. Um, mm -hmm. And because comics are like sold in specialty stores now, you know, a lot of people don't even know like that comics still exist. Like people are like, oh, they still make those. Like they still print Batman. <laughs> it's really? interesting. Yeah. Really? Wow. That's fascinating because like there's quite a comics culture, you know, like uh, um, in Europe. Like, I mean, again, like depends on places. Like I'm not even mentioning, you know, like French Belgium market because this is a completely entire like universe of its mm. own, you know, with some incredible examples and you know like why the legacy and it's just uh, you know too much to like even touch upon um but <laughs> interestingly like i'm thinking of estonia i'm thinking about russia you know like the the interest in comics is like very serious there mm. um when i go back to estonia for instance i see that the comics are often introduced into the general kind of book stores you know so you get um proper like comic sections usually they of course prefer to uh stock like collected issues and stuff you know but you get single issues as well occasionally you know um yes there are of course like specialized comic stores but you can definitely see like comics getting distributed um kind of not in just specialized places as well same for like UK as well, you go to UK, you will see comics section in the uh, most popular like bookshops. Mm -hmm. so there will always be like comics, you know, and there will be like some stuff from DC, some stuff from Image, again, usually collected issues. Right. Um, yeah, so same for Russia as well, actually, you go to bookshops and they have, they have quite a variety there, you know. Huh. But again, like Europe is... Um, European market uh, is is a whole is a whole universe here, yeah, a whole world in its own. Yeah, and when we do have comics in you know general bookstores, but it's not as much, right? Like, and typically the comics are placed in the same section as the manga, and what you'll yeah. notice is like the manga takes up like entire walls, and then it's like, okay, here's a little section of comics right here. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so that's interesting. So something that you would I noticed uh, sort of theme and like just the things that you were uh, reading and influenced by. You talked a lot about like just different sort of uh, mythology and fantasy books mm -hmm. um, and then even getting into like the sci fi stuff with 2000 AD. Um, but what I noticed is like it sounds like you gravitated toward um, I guess what you call darker or more tragic subject matter, something that like causes you to th to think um and i'm curious as to why that is like why um the books that cause you to sort of think about the human condition as opposed to like you know i guess the buzzword here is escapism like stuff that might take you to some faraway land or or distract you from whatever might be going on mm -hmm. oh 
good question. You know, it really depends because what you can maybe call it like a sort of Dostoevsky culture phenomena, you know, like we use generally kind of gravitate towards this. Uh, like stuff that requires quite um, quite emotional reaction or like thinking in the process reaction to mm. something to really think on. But again, like darker stories can be told um, very differently, you know. And especially with 2000 AD, like if you like familiarize yourself with like Pat Mills's writing, like John Wagner's writing, you know, like, these people can totally touch upon on like a multitude of different views, a multitude of different problems, multitude of different tragedies. But um, how they tell those stories um, is is the art in its own right, you know. Mm. Um, sometimes it can be pretty absurd, like, for instance, in the case of Nemesis the Warlock, like, certain things, they're, they're, they're absurd, and they really reflect on the absurdist nature of reality as well. You know, but darker stories, again, they can be, like, very different. They can be dark in terms of art, you know, it can be just, like, generally kind of like artistic approach to it, or it can be dark story as a simply horror you know mm -hmm. um and i always weirdly found that actually to tell a horror or to tell a sad story is sometimes almost i would i don't want to use the word easier because it's quite simplistic way mm -hmm. to describe it but it's um it's kind of more natural mm -hmm. to many creators you know whereas making a story that would um like for instance like humorous stories things like that many like um cartoonists working for like humoristic comics in the UK will agree with me this is often uh, a subject for debate for comics fun in the uk especially the fact that uh comics that are like as we would describe like funny ones you know mm -hmm. Uh, they require some skill to write and draw, you know, they require quite the thinking. Um, and they can also be pretty deep, you know, because the jokes that are getting delivered, again, they can be very reflective on society, they can be very reflective on people's behaviors. Like, how do you, how do you encourage that thought? Uh, so many writers and artists, they will agree that, you know, actually writing so-called, like, funny stories is way more difficult. It requires more thinking and craft. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, like some, like many, like not many, but some people from the fan base would be like, oh, you know, like these like stories are funny. They're not dark enough. Like we need like our brutal stories. And, you know, like it depends like what people describe by dark. Do, you mean, do they mean horror or do they mean just like a kind of brutal action comic, you know, mm -hmm. just like a lot of, dark action taking place, you know, right. or dark in terms of its context, because even even funny, humorous things can have a dark context, you know, yeah. and so, um, so this is why, like, I would look at everything and appreciate the approach to everything, you know, mm -hmm. whether it be, like, humorous comics, funny comics, action comics, um, um, like dark psychological comics or horror comics, like all of it. Mm. But interestingly, when it comes to like action superhero comics, mm. those I would particularly enjoy for the art, mm -hmm. like the actual like art influence. You know, yeah. Because there's a lot of dynamism taking place, you know, there's a lot of a lot of technicalities that go in there, you know. So to me, like for instance, there would be like a book for thinking, and there would be a book to like go back to and look through page by page, like some I don't know, crazy Harley Quinn story, you know. Mm -hmm. But if it was drawn by John Timms, I would be all over it. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. I love John Timms. Um, He's a great guy. Yeah. I, I think um, it's something you touched on, I think it sort of makes, it illuminates things for me, right? Like just sort of the culture um, it, uh, of Europeans, right? Kind of wanting more like meaty stories or or stories that, you know, sort of make you think or maybe reflective. Um, uh, it kind of, it, it makes sense as to why, like, you know, what we call the British invasion changed comics so much here, right? Like in the States when, you know, Alan Moore came and uh, Grant Morrison and even Mark Miller later, right? Like it's, there's a time period where it's like those darker, more sophisticated stories, like really kind of grab the culture here because we hadn't really seen that before. Um, and now they're all the rage, you know, everything is, is a bit darker here. Um, you know, whether it's in terms of like sort of a tragic tone or um, like right now, specifically horror comics are really big in the States. Um, there's, there's a lot of different independent comics popping up and a lot of them are generally have some sort of a horror lean, both horror and fantasy, uh, which is mm -hmm. fun. Um, but an another thing, I think we were just talking about sort of the nature of darker storytelling. And I think I've never written comics. I was never like a, a writer of narratives. I used to write music and mm -hmm. there, there is a, a sort of thing where it's like the darker stuff tends to come easier because it's cathartic, right? Like you may not, you know, you're, you're sort of processing things as you're putting it down on the page and in a way, you know, not having a fully fleshed out thought works for most people. Like it'll give you the emotion, even if it doesn't give you an answer to the emotions and people like that because it's like, well, I relate to feeling this emotion. Um, yeah. Whereas like humor, I feel like in humor, it almost requires you to be, or to have processed fully whatever that emotion is so that you can go back and see the humor in it and then communicate that humor in a way that even if the person that is consuming it or reading it, um, you know, hasn't fully processed their thoughts and emotions around it, they can sort of see that humor and relate to that part of it. But, yes. it, you know, I, I think both are difficult because it, it's difficult to sort of get your emotions out in a, in a big, ball or mess or whatever and then make sense of it but it's also difficult to you know sort of evolve your thought enough to find the humor and find a common thread that'll resonate with other people as well um and so my hats are off to people that can do either because i can't <laughs> right uh it's interesting like how you mentioned like how you were writing music mm -hmm. i do have like a very good friend of mine who was working on his own material and music, you know, and we often have this conversation of how to keep the balance right, because sometimes you really want to write, as you said, a cathartic song where you have to get those emotions out. Mm -hmm. um, but if you are putting an album together, for instance, if you're working on the actual set of material, then there of course has to be a song that is uplifting. And right. it can still be based on the same experience, but it can be quite sarcastic about it, can be quite mm -hmm. humorous about it. Uh, so it's an interesting balance, as you say. You know? So this is why, like for instance, when it comes to comics, um, this kind of like skill juggling in a way, you know, uh, there are some incredible artists who who can work on comics that are. Mm. Well, quite realistic in their nature, you know, and uh, require like a very realistic art style approach to them. Mm -hmm. Then they will also be drawing, let's say, Disney properties, yeah. which is a completely, completely different style. And it's also quite interesting to observe, you know, like how, how a person can just adapt and like fit so naturally in both worlds. Like, yeah. Like not just both, like, but many worlds, mm -hmm. just depending on um, the setting, the project, the emotional requirements of the project, you know. 
and how how they bring those skills, how they summon all those abilities inside them, you know, to perform perfectly. Right. Man, that's this is interesting. This conversation, I don't it's it's a very interesting conversation. Um so great. Perfect. Five AM. There we go. You know, this is <laughs> this is where the, this is where the thought flow starts. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um so 2000 AD sort of found you um, through your through your college work, um, and that makes sense because they're local. But I'm curious as to how Dynamite found you for Barbarella. Mm. Interestingly, um, so I'm <laughs> sitting quietly and drawing away some stuff for 2000 AD, you know, like. And I was thinking, you know, like at some point it would be nice to go into American market and work on like some uh, properties there. And I have to say right away, you know, like Dynamite, I've always been keeping my eye on because like Red Sonia, Barbarella, Vampirella, I just enjoy that type of um, creative field, you know, it's just like, this amazing fantasy, like female characters, you know, it would be amazing to draw one day, I always thought. So <clears throat> I actually got contacted by a talent agent mm. uh, called Chris Salvo. So he runs um, like a group called Magnus Arts, where essentially mm. like he tries to like see people with... Um, who he would think would be like suitable for American market and stuff. Okay. And we had some discussions and um, he was like, look, if you wanna try American market, I can help you. And to be fair at that time, like I already had like so many deadlines mm -hmm. and I was like, you know, like, let's, let's leave it just now. Let's maybe like, maybe later, you know, <laughs> maybe later. But turns out, <laughs> He did uh, contact uh, Dynamite, um, and they did see my work. Um, and then some months later, since our first initial conversation, he did get back to me. He was like, no, actually, Dynamite are interested in working with you. Mm. And it's Barbarella. How about that? And I was like, wow, this is amazing. I um, couldn't believe it, you know, because like I was excited. Like that, that is actually, you know, like it would be a really great new area to explore. So this is how I got linked to Dynamite, and this is how it all started. So I uh, couldn't be happier that they thought that my stuff, my style, would fit, you know, mm. to their project goals. Um, yeah, so. I've been a very happy creator <laughs> in the last, <laughs> last several months. Nice. And so um, you you said that you would be, you were familiar with Dynamite's work, so like Vampirella, mm -hmm. Barbarella. Um, for the for the listeners who may not be as familiar with Barbarella, uh, maybe talk about you know why you love that character in the story so much. Ah. You see, this is interesting. Here's like when some people will say that they were familiar, they get familiar with the movie first. Okay. The great movie with Jane Fonda, you know, obviously it was like very influential, very iconic, especially when it came to like character, like a costume design, settings design, you know. Um, like for instance, I did learn that, I did learn from Blake Northcott, who is the writer on this project, that. Uh, for instance, such bands as Duran Duran found like chose their name because Duran Duran apparently was a character in Barbarella initially, you know. Oh. And they have like songs like about Barbarella, you know. So it's very well integrated into pop culture, even though some people may not be aware, just like as I was completely unaware of that fact. But it's a fact nonetheless. You know? <laughs> so, but in my case, in my case, how I first came across Barbarella was actually the university now that I remember because it was definitely the comics that I saw first. And to be fair, um, yeah, like I remember we were, um, because it kind of laid into this like, um, 
European comic style, which was kind of reminiscent of um, work of some international artists who would work for like British market. Mm -hmm. I've always been fascinated by yes, British girls comics because they had some amazing talent working for them. You know. Mm. Uh, some Spanish artists, you know, some artists from South America. Wow, those things are incredible. You know, a lot of those kind of uh, fantasy, like, worlds, like, um, would be explored by, like, uh, female protagonists, you know, or, like, it would often be, like, horror stories such as, such as mystic comic, you know, it, it would be, like, kind of eerie, type of um, content, you know, like, um, and it was like common joke in the UK as well, that those comics, even though they were meant to be for girls, uh, girls' brothers would often steal them because some horror comics were like that good, you know? Right. <laughs> so, uh, so original comic by, I'm scared to pronounce it incorrectly, I'm very sorry, but Jean-Claude Flores, mm. um, they reminded me very much of that. So I remember coming across them and it's just like fascinating, you know, it's like a space adventure, crazy, you know, like a bit um, psychedelic, if you will. Uh -huh. Surreal. Surreal is probably the better word. For that. Surreal. Um, so this is how I like got to know about the character first by seeing some of those like um, examples of the original comics pages, you know? Oh. Yeah. I can hear you, you're oh. good. It's my camera messed up, but I, you're good. Ah, okay, okay. Okay, so, um, but then I found out that yes, Barbarella indeed exists to this day in comics. Mm -hmm. So there's been like different kind of variations and I came across some stuff online, you know, like some beautiful art by different artists. So she's always fascinated me as a character, like, like artistically. I thought that would be quite a challenge. That would be quite something to work on. Mm. So it's funny because like here in the States, um, both Barbarella and Vampirella, um, a lot of the times th the there's a stigma placed on those properties just because mm -hmm. of the covers or you know how the women are depicted in the art and so a lot of times like we're not super familiar with the story um and you know it gets placed in like a darker section of the store and stuff like that like um and it's almost treated like pornographic and so it's interesting um for you right like just talking about the the story on the inside and and being uh inspired by these sort of female heroes um and the adventures they're going on um as a woman i feel like i don't i don't know that i've ever spoken to a woman about vampirella or barbarella for that matter mm. um but I, I think that's interesting that like for you the she's really like a hero and like and, and something to like look up to in that way you know, it's a fantasy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a fantasy. Uh, and, you know, it's the type of world which allows creative exploration. You know, some interesting artistic usage. You know, mm -hmm. she's a character who can be in a variety of scenarios. You know, some of them can be a little bit on age, they can be like quite erotic, you know, they can be humorous, they can be proper action, you know, so you get to explore this kind of multitude of like it, it's it, several dimensions are to this character, you know. Mm. So, in those car again, you know, like it's interesting because every creative team they will bring something of their own, you know, and some people may take it hmm, to more of like towards a more edgy approach mm -hmm. some people would take a more kind of um like how does it like um, not humorous but like kind of cheeky approach yeah. to things you know so 
it's interesting, you know, because this character has got quite a legacy and we can see like from the very like first original source how the original creator intended for it to be, you know, and how then other teams approach this character and how she develops for it, you know. So um, I understand the thing about the stigma, of course, but it is comics and it is the world like that we can explore again like sometimes we do you know to encourage some deep thought you know sometimes it's puristicism you know sometimes it's just a funny nice adventure that is like nice to draw because you get to draw um like different worlds you get to draw something that is you know just outworldly mm. so um, yeah um like i would like I personally like seeing how characters sort of develop mm -hmm. by being tackled by different creative teams. Yes. You know, it's like pretty much like think of Batman, for instance, you know, like which was pretty much like the action comic, you know, like superhero. And then it got darker. You know? yeah. <laughs> then it got totally influenced by what we discussed before. You know, and it's a completely different thing. I mean, get for instance, um, you know, like Frank Miller's approach to things, you know, was just like, oh, completely next level. Or you can take this character and say, put him on a more kind of, um, maybe not so dark, but more like in a sci fi action setting, you know. Mm -hmm. And same with Barbella. So I think those characters go to deserve different sides of exploration, you know. And I know that even though, like, initially there was like, maybe some kind of erotic intention, which was like experimental, especially back then, you know. Uh, but now it's like uh, there's so many more things you can bring to the character. Got you. It's funny because Batman was the example I was going to give when you, as you were talking. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, Batman is one where he feels really malleable. Like there are a million different takes. There's dark, edgy Batman. There's, you know, really like horror, supernatural Batman stories. There's like kids, campy Batman stories, and they all feel like they ring true like nothing feels like it breaks the character um and so how would you describe yours and uh blake's approach to barbarella for this series ah uh, it's quite an action one <laughs> <laughs> so essentially um it's quite uh like what did it put it was like let me find it for you because okay. i saw just now, actually, uh, uh, Screen Rant described it as Barbarella officially returns with a sarcastic critique of low effort sci fi. Till there. Uh, essentially, it's a kind of metal look at the entertainment industry of today. Hmm. So, um, Barbarella finds herself in a very difficult situation when she's pretty much. But she thought that she would go on a nice vacation to an entertainment planet, only then to discover that her entire adventure is being broadcasted to billions of um, beings inhabiting the universe, you know, mm. and essentially the adventure revolves around like how she solve, how she tackles that problem, what like what she's gonna do about it. So you get a bit of like, it's quite a mix of different references, you mm -hmm. know, so um, Blake is a fantastic action writer, you know, she, like, um, I was saying like, it's a bit crazy, but with this project, I get to draw like a little bit of everything, you know, mm -hmm. because we're essentially throwing the references and um, some settings or jokes about things that people like who are familiar with um, kind of mass pop culture, they will certainly recognize them. Okay. So I guess without spoiling too much, what would you say was one of your favorite things that you got to reference uh, in these pages? To reference? You know, there's still like quite a few things to come to do. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I wouldn't maybe like, I would maybe call top answering that okay. as of yet uh simply because we're still in the process you know so there's like um 
not like I would maybe say, you know, not to reference, mm -hmm. but to uh, not to draw as well. That's it's like you know, what was your favorite thing to draw? As I said, like it's 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 it would be a difficult to answer because the action, like the 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 plot is so like we're going from one thing to another to another. Mm -hmm. You know, it's. It's quite an amazing project because you get to be, again, a bit of everything. You get to be character designer, you get to be a transport designer, mm -hmm. you get to be a setting designer, you get a little bit of everything, everything, everything. And I know there are more references to come. Mm -hmm. So um, there are like a couple of things that people recognize now probably, but there is definitely more which I'm yet to draw because we're still kind of working on the series as we go. So yeah, a difficult question. I will just say that the general process has been like super fun. Nice. Nice. Um, and so I'll, I'll ask, has the team at Dynamite been as everything you dreamed they would be? How's it been? Oh my God, pretty much, you know, like just uh, fantastic. They're so supportive. You know, uh, they're very friendly. <laughs> like, we're having a very good time in general because there's a lot of, like, great communication and, you know, like, email chains, you know. Yeah. So we're, like, kind of bouncing some ideas back and forth. But at the same time, the team, they allow me to do pretty much whatever I want on the art front. Um, and I'm going to say that, you know, because the first book, of course, it's a little bit... Um, you get a tiny bit of kind of stage fright with it. Mm -hmm. I would say, like, I certainly did a little bit. Like, you still have to kind of go through it and not to pay attention at your stage fright because ultimately the work is done. You need to deliver the project, you know. Um, but you're thinking, like, was I maybe a bit not experimental enough here? Could I be mm -hmm. maybe more creative there? Could I maybe... Mm? So the first book, of course, is a little bit like you're just kind of working things out. You're like trying yeah. to see where, how, like, how we can go, uh, what would the team like to see from me, you know. Obviously, as the process keep rolling and rolling, you become kind of like more mm, used to it and kind of become, drawing becomes looser and you're like, okay, okay, like now I've got it. So at the start, of course, I was like, like oh my God, like, it needs to be this, like I want them to like it. But to my surprise, to, to my pleasant surprise, I would say, that, um, you know, they were so happy with the pages when they saw them. They were like, no changes to them. <laughs> nice. So I was like, oh, cool. Now we, now we can relax. Now we can like, do even more. Time with this. You know, so, nice. so I was very happy that they were happy. You know, they were supportive. I was, uh, I'm very happy with just how the project is moving along, you know, like, um, couldn't help, like, couldn't possibly thank Dynamite more for the actual support, yes, behind the scenes, all the creative process and all the, like, technical side of things, you know. Um, so I'm just hoping that it keeps going as nicely as it is right now. And I'm really hoping that the readers will enjoy it as well, you know. Yeah. Because ultimately, it's... Of course, we do it for our own fun and for our, as I say, like personal artistic development. <laughs> but ultimately, the readers uh, are the ultimate um, goal here. Like, it would be very nice to hear from people who read it, mm -hmm. uh, what their thoughts are. And especially if they enjoy it, this is what makes the creators the happiest. You know? Absolutely. So you guys, the audience, will have your first chance to see Barbarella. Issue one is out here in the States on October the 2nd. Uh, so again, by the time this episode is out, you might have like a week. So <laughs> get to your local comic shop, <laughs> grab this issue, um, and then do as Anya says and let us know like what you think uh sound off on social media um and then of course you know pre-order the rest of the series as well um 
Now, do you know if this is billed as an ongoing or, or is this a limited series? Oh, not sure if I'm allowed to like, um, uh, not do the poker face on this one, essentially. <laughs> I'm not allowed <laughs> to reveal the cards. But as I said, we're still in the process. There are like a few interesting creative decisions uh, that um, will be made okay. potentially. I will probably know for sure myself next week as well. Okay. But uh, the hopes are high. You know, we're working on it. And hopefully, if it goes well, it goes well. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Listen, if you guys want more Barbarella, you got to buy more Barbarella. So um, definitely head to your local comic shop. Uh, you can pre-order that. You can even go online and pre-order it. But the most important thing is to talk to your shop, let them know, hey, I want to be down for this series. You know, we, we have to order stuff two, three, four months in advance sometimes. Uh, but that's what's going to send the signal to Dynamite to say, oh, they really like this. Let's keep pumping it out. Um, so do that. Um, and Anya, where can the audience find more of you and maybe see your work um, outside of Barbarella? Oh, the best place to go to would be my website because it also contains social media links. And my social media handles, especially Instagram one, is hard to pronounce because I do indeed have a very common name and I had to be very creative when spelling it differently on Instagram. So the website is the best place uh, that shows some work, even though it needs to be updated. And it does provide handles to social. So it's anamarzova.uk. Nice. Simple enough. So I yes. will, I'll link to Anna's website uh, in the show notes and in the description of this video here on YouTube. Um, Anna, thank you so much for being so gracious with your time, for getting up so early to talk to us. I really no, appreciate it. Oh, no, come on. My pleasure, Brandon. Thank you so much for having me. Like, it's been so great. Honestly, the time is just like, uh, I don't even think about it because with this type of work, you know, sometimes it is uh, existing this like kind of your own time zone, your own like comics time zone, let's mm -hmm. call it that, like where people just like float between schedules and deadlines and wake up whatever time so no 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 it's been my pleasure and honestly it's been a great chat awesome well thank you so much again and um yeah i'm excited this is your first big american project i hope it's the first of many um and you're welcome back anytime to discuss whatever else you'd like so um with that, I'll go ahead and wrap up, guys. Thank you again. Make sure that you go out to your shops, pre-order Barbarella. Um, issue one is out like super soon. So just go to the shop and buy it and then pre-order the rest of the series. Let your shop know that you want to be down for it. And then um, after you watch this interview, go stay safe, stay awesome and read something dope today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.